Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves, continuing medical education podcast. Join us for a lively discussion on the latest and greatest in the field of electrocardiography. We'll discuss some of the exciting and innovative work happening at Mayo Clinic and beyond with the most brilliant minds in the space and provide valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves. In this episode, we dive back into cardioneuroablation. Joining us again is an expert who continues to shape and develop this space at Mayo Clinic. We will review some of the fundamentals of cardioneuroablation, the patients best suited for the procedure, and some of the initial outcome data achieved here at Mayo Clinic. But first, let's introduce our guest today. Dr. Guru Kolgi, back with us again, an assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He completed his medical education at Maulana Azad Medical College and Delhi University in India. Before pursuing further training here in the United States, he finished his internal medicine training at the University of Connecticut and cardiology fellowship at Virginia Commonwealth University. Thereafter, he came here to Mayo Clinic in Rochester to complete his cardiac electrophysiology fellowship, and he hasn't left since. He stayed on as a Mayo Clinic scholar, and he completed a master's program in AI and healthcare. Dr. Colgi has authored well over 80 papers and manuscripts in the medical literature. He has interests spanning in cardioneuroablation, which we'll speak about more today, the applications of AI and healthcare, and much more. He's a great educator, and he actively participates in the medical community, serving on committees and ed- educational boards and editorial boards of, in the literature space. He's earned several awards, and it's no surprise that we want to keep having him back. And uh, I want to make sure you can find him on social media where he's super active and is a great educator. You can find him at the Rhythm Doc. Uh, Dr. Kolgi, thank you for joining us again. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Kasha. You're always uh, kind. Appreciate it. Well, you know, I always get excited when I talk to you because you have so much energy and you're just kind of exploring this new space. And we've done, you know, a couple episodes looking at this cardio neuroablation, but we really, you know, you have some new stuff. But before we get there, maybe we could start with more of a refresher of like, what is this whole cardio neuroablation and which are those patients that would benefit most from, from this procedure? Yeah, absolutely. So cardio neural ablation, like the uh, name suggests, is the intersection of the heart and the nerves. So it's a kind of ablation where we are targeting the autonomic nervous system. And more specifically, we are performing a vagal denervation of the heart. So we're taking away uh, the vagus nerve supply to the heart. And uh, the reason we do this is uh, most commonly for patients with hypervagotonia, so high vagal tone. Uh, symptoms like refractory vasovagal syncope, some patients with carotid sinus hypersensitivity. So when their vagal tone is high, they get slow heart rates, they get low blood pressure, they get recurrent syncope events. And the the right patient for this would be someone who's tried some conservative measures uh, like keeping themselves hydrated, uh, increasing the salt intake, try some compression uh, garments, counter pressure maneuvers. And despite all of these measures, they're still having these syncope events and recurrent presyncopal events that affect their quality of life. So those are the patients I would uh, think of doing this for. Um, for our program, uh, patients were initially referred for permanent pacemakers. So that is also part of the guidelines as a class 2B indication. So I saw most patients in that setting where they came for a pacemaker. And I was like, you know, why don't we consider this ablation before we go for a pacemaker? And uh, and it's worked pretty well. So it's a great population. You know, I've had success here uh, with some patients. And, you know, when you think of the history, because you were telling me this is not a new thing. How did it come about this whole space? Yeah. And when did you decide to, to launch that program here at Mayo Clinic? Yeah, so the ablation has been around for a long time. So the initial few cases were reported out of Brazil. Uh, Dr. Jose Pachon in Sao Paulo did these in the late 90s. One of the first publications was in 2005. And since then, they've done hundreds and thousands of these cases uh, in Brazil. And then after that, there were some countries in Europe that took this over. Uh, There's some uh, operators in Turkey who are very active with it. Um, In the US, the first case was reported in 2019. And uh, initially, it uh, it took a while for other centers to um, take this up. And then at Mayo Clinic, we started this a year and a half ago. You mentioned I did the Mayo Scholar Program. So that was a nice way uh, where Mayo Clinic allowed me to go to different centers to learn new techniques. So I went to Brazil and actually learned from Dr. Jose Pachon, who uh, came up 
remember this procedure many years ago and learned his techniques, who, which he has honed over the years. And uh, then we started the program here uh, at Mayo last October 2023. Yeah, and I know it hasn't slowed down. And in fact, I was in the room right next door from you, and I think you were doing one yesterday. So um, yes. I, I know you're busy. And, you know, so how many of these procedures have you done? And what are the outcomes from your end been from, you know, patient success and, you know, from an operator yourself? Yeah, so we've done about 30 cases so far. Uh, and then it's a good number considering um, you know, we are also part of the national registry that consists of USA and Canada. So all the cases that, were, that have been done here since 2019 amount to about 220 you know, or so. So, so we're one of the high volume centers in the country. Uh, and then when we started out, I didn't plan it that way. It just happened to be that there's so many patients who are affected with this condition uh, and then referrals kept coming in. Uh, but uh, these patients have done well. So out of the 30 patients in terms of um, the, um, I guess, indication to go for the procedure was recurrent syncopal events in pretty much all of them. So these guys, uh, these patients were having syncope on an average like four to five times in the in the previous year. So pretty frequent. Uh, and then post ablation, uh, I'll say all except one have had no recurrent syncopal event. And the one patient who had syncope had nothing objective on a, a loop recorder that was implanted. It was in the setting of getting blood draw uh, that he did have bradycardia and passed out. But, um, you know, I, I'll take that success rate because the literature reports about 85 to 90 percent success. That's, you know, we're, we're a little better than that at this point. And then uh, so far, things are looking good. So very promising um, and uh, look forward to helping more patients with this. That's great. And so, I mean, you didn't induce any, you know, arrhythmogenic or malignant arrhythmia there. I mean, that's you know, right. this form of vagal and that's, uh, that's incredible. Like in terms of, you know, so we see the success in 30, you know, out of, you said 220, I mean, you, you've probably done you're among the top five, I would say maybe even top one here in the U S that, that's doing this. And it's really amazing. Um, where do you see complications that might arise? I mean, from yours, have you, you had any of it? What are your, yeah. Yes. So, you know, it is an invasive procedure. So we, we speak about the risk of complications like groin access complications or pericardial uh, inflammation, pericarditis, pericardial bleeding. Fortunately, we haven't had any major complications. Um, some A few patients have had mild pericarditis uh, that gets better in a few days after the procedure. Um, the one expected effect of this procedure is when we perform vagal denervation, there's a higher uh, predominant sympathetic tone in these patients. So their heart rate naturally goes up. And that's almost a desired effect. But in some patients who start out a little higher, like let's say their resting heart rate is 70s to 80s to begin with, they can go up to the low 100s. And then in some patients that may cause some symptoms and, and trigger anxiety. Um, we did have one patient uh, who did not have symptoms, but then she was you know, looking at her heart rate, which is like 105 all the time. And she was a little concerned about that. Um, and then, then she said she had some symptoms. We tried a low dose beta blocker for a month and then her symptoms abated. So the literature describes uh, the same situation where they can have some sinus tachycardia early on. Most patients do well with it without symptoms, but if they have symptoms, uh, low dose beta blockers does the trick and then we can always stop it after they're feeling better. So nothing life-threatening, knock on wood, and we hope to you know, keep things that way. Right. And I, I guess you mentioned some of the beta blockers. Where are the effects now that you're kind of ablating uh, the vagus nerve are, are the inputs not fully gone or, you know, how does that work there? Yeah. So in terms of how much denervation we perform, it is based on our vagal stimulation and baseline. So when we do a vagal stimulation and we see a heart rate and blood pressure drop, we ablate till that goes away. And there's uh, probably more vagal nerve input. So we're not doing a complete denervation unless it is needed for the patient. Uh, and even after the denervation, there is some data to say over the years, the, the nerves can re -innervate. So you can have re over a period of five to 10 years, uh, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. So that depends from patient, uh, it's different from patient to patient. But at least in the short term, we're able to avoid pacemakers and improve their quality of life. You know, I, I guess before we end here, I mean, in terms of Mayo Clinic and you leading this here, you know, where do you see this in our program setting it apart from, you know, others around the world? Uh, is it similar to where you did your, your training during your scholar year? Mm -hmm. um, how do you see it? Yes. So uh, the approach is similar to what uh, the folks in Brazil are doing. So essentially, the way we stimulate the vagus is different than many other centers in the U.S. at least. So uh, one of the techniques 
that people use is they stimulate areas inside the heart, in, inside the uh, bilateral atria, so upper chambers. And when they get a vagal response, they ablate there till that vagal response goes away. And that's an acceptable technique. And other centers do it anatomically, where they don't stimulate, they just ablate these areas. Uh, what we do, I feel, is a bit more objective, where we perform extra cardiac vagal stimulation. So the catheter is sent up the neck to the vagal nerve um, uh, and, and the carotid body. And then we stimulate there. And when we see a central response, we only have to ablate so much that that, that response goes away. So if there are four or five side patients, for example, if you ablate three sites and it goes away, like case yesterday, for example, we had to ablate two sites and the vagal response went away. So we can stop right there. So one, it is objective. We know exactly when you have denervated the heart and then not causing the bradycardia anymore. And two, we limit our ablation such that, we're so, so we don't increase the risk of more arrhythmias in the future. So as you know, when we perform ablations with radio frequency, we are creating scar tissue. So we want to not ablate a lot of the heart if we can avoid it. These are young, healthy patients for the most part. So we limit our ablation, get a complete denervation. Uh, and that way, I feel our approach is a bit more objective and uh, has been reproducible and worked well so far. And that's wonderful. And maybe it goes back to why some of the, you know, you had a patient put on beta blockers, why they're still responsive, because you're mm -hmm. not uh, you know, fully ablating, you're using this extra cardiac stimulation. And I, I think that that's great. And as you know, well, you know, that scar tissue, <laughs> we don't want to be triggering anything new. Um, right. Well, in today's discussion, it, it was another exciting one here with cardio neuroablation and some of this excellent outcome data, already 30 patients here in the last year and a half at Mayo Clinic. It's always great to have Dr. Colgie here with us to share the latest in this field. He's really leading the way here at Mayo Clinic, and I really hope he'll come back and, and share any new updates. Again, make sure to follow him. He's very active on social media, and uh, it's always fun uh, to get him on here. He's got a lot of energy and a lot of great ideas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Kashi. Always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to a Mayo Clinic cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in every other week to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic. This has been a Mayo Clinic podcast.